All right, good evening, everyone. Welcome to uh, our week eight now. Wow, it's gone so fast. Week eight, week eight on the abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness. And uh, I can tell you, I love this topic because every time I get a chance to teach it, God just ministers afresh and anew and reminds me what he's done for me, his amazing love, this new covenant. And um, I'll tell you tonight, what we're going to do is we're going to rediscover this new covenant. We're going to Present, I'm going to present to you this new covenant of grace in light of the old covenant. It's going to be a contrast tonight. And um, I hope that you enjoyed this. This has been a labor of love for me. Uh, it's blessed me amazingly to see the, uh, the bird's eye view, a big picture of what's going on here, besides all the things you've learned throughout the last several weeks. So what we're going to find out is that the old covenant and the new covenant, there are some differences between them. Uh, first of all, the old covenant is a conditional covenant. Conditional. There are conditions to it. Okay. Uh, we're going to start out reading something from Deuteronomy. Okay. So let's begin. In Deuteronomy, it says, Now it shall be, if you first diligently obey the voice of the Lord, your God, being careful to do all his commands, which I command you today, then the Lord, your God, will set you high above all the nations of the earth. And all these blessings will come on you and overtake you. If you see this condition, if you obey the voice of the Lord, your God. Blessed shall you be in the city and blessed shall you be in the country. But this is that but right. But it shall not come about if you do not obey the voice of the Lord, your God, to observe, to do all his commandments, which, by the way, is 613, not just the 10, 613 commandments, to do all his commandments and his statutes with which I charge you today. The speaker is Moses. Then all these curses shall come upon you and overtake you. So there's a curse if you don't do condition. It's a very it's a conditional covenant. This comes from the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 28, verses one, two and three, and also verse 15. In that chapter it tells you about all the curses as well. So it's a very lengthy chapter. But what we're going to find out about this new covenant, the cross changed everything. It's amazing what the finished work of Jesus Christ has accomplished and what we've seen through the several the past several weeks of our lessons. So now we're going to see it contrasting old covenant with new covenant. Jesus Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law. Now, you notice we were looking at Deuteronomy and said there was a curse. It says Jesus has redeemed us from the curse of the law being made a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone that hangs on a tree. And that the blessing of Abraham might come on the Gentiles through Jesus Christ. And that the context is the Gentiles and that we Gentiles might receive the promise of the spirit through faith. This comes from the book of Galatians, chapter three, verses 13 and 14. What did Jesus do? Well, do you remember first week? Romans 5, 19. It was by one man's disobedience, Adam, that many were made sinners. So that's why we sinned. Because he made us sinners and that's what we did. We sinned. But by one man's obedience, that man is Jesus Christ, many will be made righteous. He made it available. Okay? Through him. That's what he did. And we're going to discover this more in detail again tonight. So presenting this new covenant of grace. For if that first covenant, I'm talking about the first covenant, we're contrasting old and new. So right now we're going to look at the old. This comes from the book of Hebrews. For if that first covenant, the Mosaic covenant, had been faultless, there would have been no occasion sought for a second covenant. For finding fault with them, the context is Israel. He didn't find fault with the covenant. He found fault with the people who made a covenant to him, Israel. He said, behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Not like the covenant, Mosaic covenant, the covenant they swore to be in covenant with God back in Exodus. 
not like the covenant which I made with their fathers on the day when I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt, which is their house of slavery. For they did not continue, which means, which means they did not persevere in my covenant. Which covenant? The covenant they swore to be in covenant with God, the Mosaic covenant. They were not faithful to keep their end of the bargain. So what we read in um, Deuteronomy 28, a curse had to fall on them. They fell under the cursing. And I did not care for them, says the Lord. This comes from Hebrews 8, verses 7 through 9. Now there's a few more verses that we're reading. Verse 10. This is the covenant I will make with the house of Israel. God is saying, I'm going to make a covenant with them. After that time, declares the Lord. I will put my laws. Do you notice that word is plural? Laws, plural, right? In their minds and write them in their hearts. And I will be their God. They will be my people. Verse 11. No longer will a man teach his neighbor or a man his brother saying, know the Lord. Because they will all know me from the least of them to the greatest. For I, notice everything is I, I, where's our part so far? It's the father, you notice? Mm -hmm. For I will forgive their wickedness. And I will remember their sins, plural, it's the noun. Sins. No more. That word no more is a double negative. It actually means not even possible. In the Greek, there is the word u for the word no, and there's the word me. If you put them together, it strengthens the denial. So he's emphatically saying not, it's not even possible for me to remember their sins based on this new covenant. Hebrews, we started at verse 7. It finishes off at verse 12. So I just read verses 10 through 12. So now I'm going to contrast verse 10 that we just read, where it comes back. It's originally quoted in the book of Jeremiah, chapter 31, verse 33. So let's read again verse 10 in Hebrews 8. This is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after that time, declares the Lord. I will put my laws. Remember I pointed that out to you earlier? Plural. I will put my laws in their minds and write them on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they will be my people. Let's look at the original quote from Jeremiah. Let's see if we see something different. This shall be the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my law. Hang on. Singular. Okay. So we're going to question this in a minute. I will put my law in their inward parts and write it in their hearts and I will be their God and they shall be my people. Is this the Mosaic law that God is writing on their hearts? Hmm. And that's what we've been taught. Not the, not the rituals, the animal sacrifices. Um, it's not the, um, the, it's not the animal sacrifices, not that system anymore. That's been done away with. There's no tabernacle, so there's no animal sacrificing. But they'll say this is the moral law. This is the teaching that I spoke on last week about the moral law. But really what this is, this new covenant is about Christ. It's about Jesus. It's actually his new commands. Let's find that out. Jesus said it this way in the Gospel of John, verse 13, uh, chapter 13, verse 34. He says, a new command I give to you, that you love one another. Notice this, that you love one another. I'm emphasizing it as I have loved you, that you also love one another. It's a commandment that Jesus gave. It's a new commandment, if you notice, right? Let's add a little bit more to this. In other words, Jesus was telling us to survey his love, the depth, the width, the height, and the length of his love for us, because it's about you're to love others as I have loved you, not love people the way you love yourself, it's even greater. It's his love for you that he gave himself up for us. It's much more. It's agape. It's true agape love. Our love is inferior compared to his love. It's imperfect. Let me add some more stuff to this. Same writer, John. He writes an epistle. This epistle was written in the 90s. It's in the 90s. This is a long past when all the gospels were put together. This is his commandment. 
that we believe in the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and love one another just as he commanded us way back in the Gospel of John many moons ago. Same epistle. Now we're in chapter 5. The writer says, For this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments. What did Jesus said? Love one another as I have loved you. That's the context. His commandment is to believe in Jesus and love one another. And guess what? That commandment is not a burden. It's not burdensome. He said, my burden is light. Mm -hmm. And that's what he's implying. And this is the consistency with this Jesus commandments. This new covenant, it's, it's not external, it's internal. The new covenant examines your mind and your heart. And this new covenant, because it's on your mind, it's in your heart. Remember, new mind being renewed, a new heart from an old heart of stone, right? This will cause you through the new birth that's in you to will and do of God's good pleasure because of who you are and the life that's now in you. You have pleasure in doing and fulfilling. When you don't, you just don't feel right. What fulfills you is walking out the life that's in you. This new covenant also says that, remember, we read it in Hebrews. 8, verse 12, the last verse of that section we read. God said, I will forgive their wickedness and I will remember their sins no more, not even possible. So, let's define the word covenant. What does the word covenant mean? Well, the word covenant is also the word will and testament. It's all the same word. A set agreement having complete terms determined by the initiating party, which are fully affirmed by the one entering the agreement. So here's the question. When did this new covenant, this new testament, this will of God begin? Well, if we took our Bibles, anyone that got a Bible with them? Let's see if your Bible is the same as the one that's on this monitor. Turn to Matthew chapter 1. And maybe you might see this, like what you see on the screen. Matthew chapter 1. Right? And then I'm going to ask you to turn back just one page. Do you see what I see? It is the wider page. It says, the New Testament of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Something to that effect you're going to see. Is that in your Bible as well? It says, Something, it says New Testament, right? Okay, so there's a divider page. So we see that, so any page before that's the Old Testament. Okay, so, all right, so you, there's a divider page. Okay, so here's the question then. Is this where the New Testament begins? Hmm, food for thought. Let's examine this, okay? Let's examine this. When did the New Testament begin? When was it inaugurated? Let's see it in scripture. I like, your, I like where you're going. Let's prove it or disprove it. Let's see what scripture says. The book of Hebrews, we're examining the book of Hebrews tonight because all our lessons are coming strictly from a book that's very misunderstood by the body of Christ and not studied at all. Very few Christians really study the book of Hebrews. They quote from it, but don't really grasp what's in there because they think it's only for like the Jews. I'll explain more details about that next week when we get one more chapter, one more lesson on the book of Hebrews next week. Now we're reading this verse. It says, in the case of a will, which is the word covenant and testament, in the case of a will, it is necessary to prove the death of the one who made it. Now just imagine a will and testament, your last will and testament, that you want to take your possessions and pass it off to your loved ones. All right, so keep that in mind. So you have to prove the death of the one who made the will. Because a will is enforced only when someone has died. It, is never, it never takes effect while the one who made it is still living. Verse 22. In fact, the law requires that nearly everything be cleansed with blood, and without the shedding of blood there is no forgiveness of sins. This context is coming from the book of Hebrews. We're now in chapter 9. Verses 16, 17, and 22. A will... Would you think for a second if you had possessions and you said, I want to make sure my kids get it when I pass away and your kids try to pull a prodigal son and say, hey, dad, mom, can I get that now before I go? Do you know that if you wanted to do it, 
the law will stop you? Mm-hmm. Can't get that. Sure. They would say it's illegal. Mm-hmm. Okay? You have to prove the death of the one to make it. Okay? Now, if you want to give them something, that's not the same as a will. So let's, let's look at this, and, and let me paint a picture for you. This picture is we are over here where it says uh, the inauguration of a new covenant. We have to prove the death of one who made it. To understand the difference between the new covenant when it begins and when it didn't begin, it took place at Jesus' death. You were right. It was at his death, not at his birth. Christmas time, Jesus in the manger, baby Jesus, that is not the beginning of the New Testament. In the book, it says that, the Bible. There's a divider page that we saw. But a will is not enforced until there's a death that's been proven at the cross. So during Jesus' lifetime, he was an Old Testament prophet. He was born under law, ministered to people under the law. But while he was there, he was prophesying to them about this new covenant to come, this kingdom to come. Right. You see. So he had two ministries going on. So now this helps us understand when we read over the Gospels, some of the hard sayings of Jesus. We're going to get into that tonight. For example, we have the sections on Jesus where he's very friendly. The things that he says, it just touches us. But secondly, then we have those, those times when it's like Jesus with a sword. You start reading the Sermon on the Mount. And I'll go over some of those points a little bit in a moment. Jesus had two ministries while he operated as an Old Testament prophet. First ministry was he was prophesying this coming of this new covenant kingdom to come, this covenant of grace. And the second ministry, he focused on enlightening everyone around him who was under the law about the true spirit of the law and that covenant they were under. In his first ministry, he prophesied the coming of the new covenant of grace, right? Mm -hmm. Number one, he prophesied the Holy Spirit will come in the Gospel of John, chapter 14. In Luke 17, he prophesied the kingdom of God is coming. In Matthew 4 and Matthew 10, he prophesied that the kingdom is near. In Luke 17, he prophesied that the kingdom is within you. Prophesied it. Didn't come yet. In John 5, Jesus revealed that he is the vine and we are the branches. John 5, again, same verse. Jesus prophesied that apart from him, we could do nothing because we're still in Adam. In John 3, Jesus revealed the love of God. In Luke 11, Jesus revealed God as our Heavenly Father. That was foreign to the Jews. They just saw him as God and all the other names of God that they knew him by. Not as Daddy God. That was very foreign. His second ministry, he enlightened everyone around him about the true spirit of the law. The Sermon of the Mount. He would say things like this. Cut off your hand if it offends you. Pluck out your eye if it offends you. Don't think lustful thoughts. Don't get angry or call someone a fool. Love your enemy. Bless, be good to them, and pray for them. Sell everything you have. Be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. These are hard sayings. Okay? Understand, he's giving them uh, he's raising the bar on what they already know about this Mosaic law. So those hard sayings of Jesus, is that the gospel? We've been preached that by a lot of the religious crowd that want to bring us back to their control methods of what they understand of the gospel. But they don't even realize that that's under the old covenant. He's speaking to people under the old covenant. Jesus is proclaiming the gospel. Paul explained the gospel once it was fulfilled. And that's why the letters written to the epi- in the epistles were written to the believers. Everything else was not necessarily written to the believers. It was written to unbelievers to get them to believe. So they would understand so they can see their need for salvation. Jesus' method, for example, he would give the law to people, but he would still love them. Do you remember the rich young ruler? There are three accounts of it. This one from Mark, it says that Jesus looked at him. He loved him and he said, one thing you lack, go your way and sell whatever you have and give it to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven and come and follow me. Some people think that's the secret to life. You have to be poor. That's how you earn salvation. No, salvation is a free gift. It can't be bought. 
This guy's God was his money. Jesus had a conversation with him. All these things I've kept. Oh, really? He went to commandment number one. Thou shalt have no other gods. Sell everything you got. His money was his God. He was wealthy. That was, that was too difficult for him. And you'll have treasures in heaven. Couldn't let it go. He gave him what I call Moses 2.0. He, he raised the bar. Jump over this. I know you can jump over this table, but now jump over this table like this. I can't do it. Right. You need someone to help you. Someone who can do it for you. What we see is that Jesus was operating, as I said, in two ministries. Prophesied about the new way to come. And he was burying these religious people that had pride about their accomplishments under the law. He kept raising the bar, giving them Moses 2.0. See, the law comes and it shows us our need for a savior. You see that in Romans. Romans 3, and those are all the verses, also in the book of Acts and in Galatians, those are your verses. The law is like a mirror. It shows you where the dirt is, but the law does not clean you up. We can look in that mirror to our right, your left, and if your face is dirty, you can't pick up the mirror and clean your face with it. It's not going to, it just points out where the dirt is at. So you realize I need some super detergent to clean myself. That's Christ, what he's done for us. You see the Super Bowl? He's your tide. <laughs> I just, I'm sorry, I just throw that out there. I enjoyed, there were so many funny commercials, I had to put that out there. Okay. The law comes from a very steep mountain called Sinai. Okay, but Jesus comes and tells us, come to Mount Zion, two different mountains. Jesus is saying, stay off that mountain. If you've come to me, stay off that mountain. In 2 Corinthians 3, 6, it says that he has made us, believers, competent as ministers of a new covenant, not of the old covenant, of this new covenant of grace, not of the letter, but of the spirit. For the letter kills, that's the context is talking about the old covenant, but the spirit gives life. And the problem is that when you place people, man, under law, as we saw in Romans 7, because sin lives in us, man is unable to keep the law because sin's looking for an opportunity to deceive us and trick, trick us up. The law did not die. True believers died to the law, though. We've been released. Romans 7, 4. We studied this out several weeks ago. Therefore, my brothers, you also have become dead to the law through the body of Christ, that you may be married to another, to him who was raised from the dead, that we should bear fruit to God. Same chapter, verse 6. But now we have been not only died to the law, we've been delivered from the law, having died to what we were held by, so that we should serve in what? Not the oldness, but the newness of the spirit, and not in the oldness of the letter. Matthew 5, 8. For I say unto you, until heaven and earth pass away, not the smallest letter or stroke shall pass from the law until all is accomplished. The law is still around. We just died to its power of our life. We've been released from it. And the purpose of the law is to point, like Jesus did, point out to people, hey, you need a Savior. You can't keep this. You can't be perfect like your Heavenly Father. And that's what God requires, perfection. So he offers that in exchange. He gave us his Son to perfectly cleanse us. See, the Old Testament story is one that declares Israel did not remain faithful to their covenant with God. That's why he swore he would make a new covenant. And God resolved the situation of their unfaithfulness. God's response was, I turned away from them. In the book of Acts, chapter 7, verse 42 reads, But God turned away, and he gave them over to the worship of heavenly bodies. This agrees with what is written in the book of the prophets. Did you bring me sacrifices and offerings 40 years in the desert, old house of Israel? He turned away from them because it was a conditional covenant. The new covenant says that God's face is always toward you, though. 2 Timothy 2.13 says, If we are faithless, he will remain faithful, for he cannot disown himself. When God swore this covenant to Abraham, did you know that this new covenant is, was, the, was the Abrahamic covenant, but it was being foreshadowed, it hadn't been fulfilled until Christ came to fulfill it. Abraham's covenant with God, God swore a covenant to him. Abraham fell asleep when he woke up, it was done. 
Abraham had, had no part but to believe, and he received. And he was given righteousness by faith. What we have today is the fulfillment of it because Jesus totally removed all sin, the offenses, by his sacrifice. And God was well pleased when he judged his son to be sin who knew no sin so that we could be made the righteousness of God through him, by faith, through grace. And so when God swore this covenant to Abraham, Abraham went to sleep. When he woke up, it was done. And this is the verse, Genesis 15, 12 reads, As the sun was setting, Abraham fell into a deep sleep, and a thick, dreadful darkness came over him. And you see the story that he talks about uh, his descendants being in Egypt. But when Abraham woke up, that covenant was done. God swore to himself. He could swear by no other greatest, so he swore to himself. In the Abrahamic covenant, God swore by himself within the Godhead. Hebrews 6.13 tells us, For when God made this promise to Abraham, because he could swear by no one greater, he swore by himself. And when God swears to you by himself, you know what that gives you? Absolutely. It gives you hope. And this hope, Scripture tells us, is an anchor for our souls. Same chapter, verse 19 in Hebrews. We have this hope as an anchor for the soul. This hope is firm and secure. It, the it is referring to this hope. This hope entered the inner sanctuary behind the curtain. This hope's got a name, and his name is Jesus. Okay? What is our role? Let's keep on reading. Men swear by someone greater than themselves when they give an oath to confirm something. So what? It can put an end to all arguments. That's what the scripture tells us. But God, he wanted to make his unchanging nature and his purpose very clear to the heirs of that promise to Abraham, righteousness by faith. He confirmed that promise with an oath. So the context is telling us when God did it, he did it to put an end to all arguments. That's the preceding verse. When God gave Abraham this covenant, he swore it. And he wanted to make sure that the heirs knew to end all argument. That's why he swore it by an oath. The context is men do it to end an argument. God did to say there is no argument. It's settled. You're secured in me. You're anchored in me and I am your hope. My son walked through that veil and that veil tore in two. Okay. Welcome in. Verse 18. God did this so that by two unchangeable things in which it was impossible for God to lie, we who have fled to take hold of the hope offered to us may be greatly encouraged. I'm going to go through this a little bit more in detail in a moment. Verse 18, you see a little asterisk next to it? So keep that in mind. And I'm also going to do verse 19 a little bit more detail. We had this hope as an anchor for the soul, firm and secure. This hope entered the inner sanctuary behind the curtain. What are the two unchangeable things that we just read? I'll read that verse again. Verse 18. God did this so that by two unchangeable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, we who have fled to take hold of this hope that's offered to us may be greatly encouraged. So what are the two unchangeable things? Oh, can't oh, God can't lie. Okay, that's number one. And what's the other one? Nobody got an answer? No, no, no. I'm going to sound like a broken record. And God can't lie. God can't lie? And God can't lie. I'm a broken record. Why did I do that? Why do I sound like a scratch record? Because the Father made this covenant with the Son. And within the Godhead, they both can't lie. And think about it for a minute. Jesus became the Son of Man. He entered and became one of us. And as the son of man, he entered into covenant with God, even though he's God. Right? You follow me? And as, as a man on our behalf, he's keeping this covenant as a man. And he's sitting at the right hand of God. Finished work. He sat down. He purged our sin. Done. So as a man, as our representative, like Adam was, we're no longer in Adam, we're in Christ. There are two unchangeable things that we have. We are secured in this covenant. Right. God don't lie and God can't lie. 
Amazing. So you got a father and a son that swore his covenant and took us out of the equation. So if one of them break the covenant, then we're doomed. The condition is on them, not on us. Our condition is to believe and receive. Amen. That's what's wonderful about this new covenant. See, religions give you rules and rules and rules. And there's a survey by a group called the Barna Survey, and some Christians several years ago were polled around the nation, and 81% of them said that Christianity is all about rule-keeping. Rule-keeping, okay. keeping the rules. Uh -huh. So we're no different than any other religion then. But they're wrong. It's not about rule keeping, but religion has taught us that, so that's why they thought that. No, it's not about rule keeping. It's about what Christ has done. We have a new life, yeah. and, we're, and we're divinely transformed from the inside out, and we begin to live this life. We be, we're living out what he's put in us, and what fulfills is just walking this out, and we're secured in him. He's our hope, anchored for the soul. The soul, when your feelings are wild, I don't know if I'm right with God, it's not about your feelings. It's about your Savior. It's not how big your sin is. It's how big your God is. It's a big difference. So again, this new covenant, the two unchangeable things is about God the Father and God the Son. This is the new way. The trustworthiness about the character of God the Father and the trustworthiness character of the Son. The new covenant is all about God the Father and God the Son. We are beneficiaries of this promise that God made with himself. He invites us in. And this promise to Abram, I say Abram because this was before his name was changed to Abraham. And the law came 430 years later when the law was given. Tell, someone tell me one of their favorite cars. Just give me a name of a favorite car that you would love to have one day. Lexus, which one? The 450, I forget the name of it. Okay, what does that car normally go for? What does it go for? Like brand new, top loaded with everything. Just give me a number. 48,000. 48,000, okay, let's just say 50,000. Well, let's just choose the number 50,000. Let's use that number as an example. And you go to the dealership, you've been shopping around, and you happen to cash this deal, and you go to him, and you know it's 50 grand. And he tells you, you know what, we got this super sale that I can hook you up with. I talk to management and I can sell you this car for 30 grand. Would you, would you sign up for it? Sure, no problem. Draw up the contract. He draws up the contract. You agree to 30 grand. You got 20 grand off this brand new loaded car right out the dealer. It's not hot. This is the real thing. You do what you got to do. You sign off, you make the deal. 30 grand. Awesome. 430 days go by. So a little over a year, not two years. And that individual happens to call you on your cell phone, leaves you an answer machine message because you don't pick up because, like, who's this? You know, who does that, right? Call ID, right? <laughs> so you're, you're screening your calls. And then you listen to it, and he's sounding like, you know, hey, I'm sorry to just contact you, but you know what? I remember that deal that we did, you know, some time ago. Uh, my manager told me that that was the wrong price. I had to give you for 40000 So I need you to come on into the dealership so we can retake care of this contract so that, you know, we can do it correct. Okay, okay. Here, here's, my, here's my point. First of all, can he do that? No, no. no. Ah, you have a contract. You see the difference? When God gave the Mosaic Covenant to Israel, he had already promised righteousness by faith to the heirs. See? Then 430 years later, Israel got prideful in Exodus 19 and said, God, all that you say we can do. Oh, really? Try these top 10 things. He gave them the law. And then eventually, when Moses came down, there was more. It ended up being 613 commands. But let's just make it real simple. I just started reading in Deuteronomy 28. If you keep, then you'll be blessed. If you don't, you fall on the curse. So the whole old covenant came to a point where you just became, uh, you fell under the curse. It was based on man. This new covenant, he took man out and he put another man in our place. It kept, and he kept the covenant. And he's keeping the covenant on our behalf. Follow me? So this covenant that we have, it's amazing that 430 years later, the law came in, but it does not annul what God established with Moses. If anything, it was just an addendum to point out to them their need for a savior. That's what the law's purpose was. The book of Galatians works over time to remind us of this. Galatians 3 verse 17 says, what I mean is this, that the law introduced 430 years later does not set aside the covenant previously established by God. 
That's the Abrahamic covenant. And do away with that promise of righteousness by faith. Because we've been given a better covenant. Our anchored promise is secured within God making a promise to himself. The old covenant problem was Israel couldn't keep up their end of the deal. They were, they were the ones unfaithful. The new, the new covenant solution is that God swore within himself concerning this new covenant. And it depends on Jesus and the Father. He invites us in. Receive freely. So looking back at Hebrews 6.19 now, that's why we have this hope. And we're anchored. If you're on a boat and it's rocking because of the waves, you put an anchor down, it settles you. Jesus is our anchor. Amen. We are secured for our souls where the feeling, where the emotions, where everything's riled up because we hear certain words that try to disturb us and rob, of, rob us of our peace. Mm -hmm. Firm and secure. This hope entered. Hope entered? That means hope got feet. It walked. And his name is Jesus. He entered the inner sanctuary behind that curtain into the most holy place with his blood. The Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Mm -hmm. This new covenant brings a new kind of freedom. And that's what scares people. They don't know what to do with this freedom. See, the former regulations, we're still in the book of Hebrews. Now we're just looking at Hebrews 7. The former regulations were set aside because it was weak and useless. For the law made nothing perfect. But a better hope, meaning this new covenant, was introduced by which we draw near to God. Did you know that this verse we just read described the law as weak and useless? Nothing wrong with the law. It's perfect, holy, just, and good. But the minute it's put, in, it's put before man to fulfill, he can't. So the law is weak to help them and useless to help them to become perfectly righteous. <clears throat> See, this new covenant, it does make you perfect. In what way? Not perfectly behaved. That's the work of the Holy Spirit. He makes you perfectly cleansed. Once and for all, he's removed your stain and offense of sin. And he's made you perfectly righteous with his righteousness. He took our filthy rags of righteousness in exchange for his. Wow. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. What does the scripture say about this old covenant? Same chapter, verse 13, Hebrews 8, 13. By calling, this, by calling this covenant new, he has made the first one obsolete. What is obsolete? And aging will soon disappear. Let me give you an example of uh, obsolete. Who here is still using an Apple iPhone 1? That's what I thought. Crickets. Anybody ever owned one? I did. The first one. I've owned it when it came out in 2008. Am I using it today? Oh, no. No, we've moved on. It became obsolete. So let me give you a quick illustration. If you leave your country where you personally live at, to go to another country to become royalty in that country, you must leave everything behind that you've come from. So whatever country of your origin and you went to another country and they want to make you a king there or a queen there, great. Wherever you came from, has, you have to leave it all behind. Your clothes, your property, your possessions, because they're going to give you new stuff in this new country and dress you up in that. So you're, you have to leave the former country behind so you can become royalty in a new country. He took off all the laws, clothing, everything that held us back and restricted us and said, here, like the prodigal son, give him a robe. Give him a ring and put sandals on his feet. Give him my righteousness. You're in a kingdom of grace and when you came out of a kingdom of law, so to speak. This is a picture of abandoning the old country of law and become royalty in this new country of grace. You became a royal priesthood in this new country of grace. In this holy nation. Peter tells us this, but you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people belonging to God, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of, we were in darkness. He called us out of darkness into his wonderful light. Once you were not a people. 
See, that's when we were in Adam. But now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. First Peter 2, 9 and 10. We were Gentiles in this old country. We were never even under the old covenant law. We were, Jews were given that. The only covenant we were invited to was a new covenant. And through the uh, Abrahamic covenant, he says that he would be the person, father of many nations. Okay? Jew and Gentile. One new man in Christ. So, we were never under the old covenant law, yet today we're still debating law and grace, 2,000 years after Jesus' crucifixion. Scripture tells us, Therefore remember that you were formerly Gentiles by birth, and you were called uncircumcised by those who called themselves the circumcised. You know, those who are circumcised by the hands of men. But remember that at that time, you were at that time, before when we were in Adam, we were separated from Christ. We were excluded from citizenship and God's people, in this case, Israel. We were foreigners to this covenant, promise of God to Abraham. We were without hope, without God, the true God in this world. That comes from Ephesians 2, 11 and 12. But now, the next verse. In Christ Jesus, you who were formerly far off, you've been brought near by the blood of Jesus. To what? We were brought near to what? The context tells us we're brought near to Christ. We're brought to citizenship of Israel. Basically, we became the people of God. Brought near to this covenant of grace. We were able to come into covenant. Brought near to him, hope. Brought near to God in this world. This is a new covenant of grace. We were never even invited to the old covenant. But we get bamboozled to go pick and choose like a buffet line what to follow within the old covenant. We were taught that. It's a mixture. Our problem is that we get nervous with the freedom that we're going to have in Christ. What are we going to do with this freedom? We're scared that we're going to go sin. That's what the religious people tell us. So we need something to guide us, a moral code. We think that if we trust Jesus, we're going to stress out and we're going to start leading us to a free fall of sin. That's what the religious people think. That people under grace are just going to sin like crazy. No, people who really understand grace realize what God has done. He who is forgiven much loves much. He who really understands the forgiveness of God and, and the separation that even in their own disappointments in life, I can look at myself and say, why, Lord, would you love and give this to me? Because I knew I couldn't change my path. I was set for hell in a handbasket, first class ticket. And he saved me and broke, he broke my heart in half because of his amazing love. Why me? Why would you give this? I'm the least who deserves it. I know I'm going to blow it again. And I heard the Holy Spirit whisper it to me clearly. Son, now you understand my grace. And it just dawned on me, even in spite of the next dumb thing I might do, but didn't realize he didn't leave me to figure it out. He gave me a new life, a new heart, his desires in my heart, the Holy Spirit in my heart to lead me to, be full, to fulfill what he has destined for me. And it took away the religious shame of disappointing him. There's a healing. I accepted you as you are, but didn't leave you as you are because I'm giving you a new heart. I'm giving you the Holy Spirit, a new spirit. I'm going to walk this out with you, through you. Watch me as I love you. And it, it amazes me how good he is. And another thing is we believe that we need, like I said, uh, some moral compass, like the Ten Commandments to be our safety net in case we fall into immorality. Okay? We believe that, you know, we need Jesus for salvation and a ticket to heaven. That's what we believe. That's what we've been taught. And then, of course, we believe that we must do everything else on our, on our own for our daily living to maintain our salvation by keeping some kind of moral guide. But see, the thing is, we're trusting the Holy Spirit to live this out through us. And he's more than enough. Because the bottom line, if, if we're trusting the moral code, then what's the use of the fruit of the Holy Spirit? It's worthless. Do we take Jesus for his blood so we can get a ticket to heaven and not trust his life-changing Holy Spirit? The gospel is calling us to take away that safety net, like walking a tight wire and suddenly finding your balance in his grace. Do we really... Does this really include the Ten Commandments? Yes, it does. 
we're dead to them. It doesn't mean that we don't walk out a life that produces fruit. It does, but it's the new life that's in us. If you, if you went and you interviewed Abraham, and you talk about Moses and about keeping the Ten Commandments, you say, Moses who? You never heard of him. You follow me? He had righteousness by faith, and that's what we're given. So can we really trust the Holy Spirit for every ounce of morality? Second yep. Corinthians tells us, but if this ministry of death, which is written on letters of stone, came with glory so that the sons of Israel could not look intently at the face of Moses because the glorious face was fading away? How will the ministry of the Spirit fail to, fail to be even more glorious? For if this ministry of condemnation, which is the ministry of death mentioned in verse 7, has glory, much more those, much more those the ministry of righteousness abound in glory. Here's a question. What part of the law was written on stone? Thank you. Yes, the Ten Commandments. And he called it a ministry of death and a ministry of condemnation. It's holy, righteous, and good, but it demands perfection. Man is unable to perfectly keep it. So, Ten Commandments. The Apostle Paul called the Ten Commandments a ministry of death and a ministry of condemnation. For those who can't keep its demands. Again, Romans 7, we read it earlier. Well, I read some parts of it. This is a different one. What shall we say then? Is the law sin? May it never be. Just the opposite. On the contrary, I would not have come to known sin except through the law. The law identified it. It's the mirror. It identified the power of sin too, besides sinning and offenses. For I would have no, known what coveting was if the law had said, you shall not covet. Guess where that comes from? The 10th commandment of the 10 commandments. Romans 7, 7. The Apostle Paul tells us that while he was under the law, he had coveting lustful of every time, of every kind. Why? Because the law said don't do within him the power of sin and the flesh's ways of thinking was saying, hey, you could do that. And there it is. The dynamic of how it worked within him. And that's how it works. Yes. Did you know that the law excites sin? We covered that in Romans 7. The power of sin which lives in every man even after you're saved. Thank God he's going to give us a new body where sin does no longer dwell. Okay? And we're not slaves to this power of sin. But sin taking the opportunity through the commandment produced in him. The context is talking about Paul. It produced in him passionate longing lust. That's what covenant, uh, coveting means. Of every kind. For apart from the law, this power of sin is dead. For sin taking an opportunity through the command deceived me and through it it killed me. Apart from the law, the power of sin is dead. See, the thing is, we don't need a part of the law. Scripture is telling us that we need to be apart from the law and under grace so that the power of sin doesn't have dominion over our lives. And this, then we have people that want to teach us, well, we have to balance law and grace. We, you know, there has to be a balance. Well, people who argue for a balance between law and grace, you know what they're doing? They're arguing for a balance between sin and grace because the law excites sin in your life. That's a terrible thing to say, but it's an honest truth. Sounds offensive, but it's true. Because being under law excites this power of sin within us. But if we're dead to it, it's dead to us. It's power. Again, reading Romans 7, 8. But sin taking the opportunity by the commandment. Sin produced these passionate longing lusts of every kind. For apart from the law, sin is dead. Could it be that the law, <laughs> the law becomes a source of our struggle? when we try to obey it? Think about that for a minute. Romans 7, 5. For while I was in the flesh, sin, sinful passion, which were aroused by the law, were at work within the members of my body to bear fruit to death. The law I thought that was going to bring life actually brought death. I once was alive apart from the law, but when the commandment came, this power of sin became alive and I died. And this commandment, which was to result in life, it proved to result in death for me. See, the law is not a buffet line of multiple choice options. Like, let's use the Ten Commandments, for example. Some people don't follow the Ten. They say it's the Nine. You didn't know that? Oh, yeah, we don't celebrate the Sabbath. Then it's the Nine Commandments. We're picking and choosing, right? James says it this way. James chapter 2, verse 10. 
For whoever keeps the law yet stumbles in just one point is guilty of breaking some of it. I'm sorry. It says all of it. Held accountable. You have to be perfect. Galatians 3.10 says, All who rely on observing the law are under a curse. For it is written, Curse is everyone who does not continue to, what? To do some things written in the book of the law. Most things, buffet line, multiple choice, everything. These are high standards. And this is what Jesus was doing under his ministry. Some pick and choose which laws they want and they throw out the ones they don't want. God's word says that if you want the law, it's all or nothing. It's an all or nothing curse. Listen to what I'm not saying, so I make sure that I'm clear with this. I'm not saying let's throw out the Old Testament. I know it can be implied for what I'm saying. So then what good is the Old Testament? No, it's God's word. It conveys the struggle and the truth that all of mankind has gone through, including us and what we've been affected by because of what Adam has done. But it tells you the full revelation of what Christ has done so we can look back on now with a new pair of glasses and see things now from a surprise ending. Okay, everything from Genesis to Revelation is God inspired word. But God had a surprise ending in the Gospels. In the light of this surprise ending, you now can look back and you can reinterpret everything in this new light. There is a surprise ending in the Gospels. It's called the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross. The resurrection, this new indestructible life that he gives us. And there are some announcements. What are the announcements? There are four of them. You're dead to the law, Romans 7. You are not under the law, Galatians 5. You are not supervised by the law, Galatians 3. Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. That's the demands of the law to become righteous. So now you can go back and read the Old Testament in light of the gospel surprise ending because we now have the right glasses on, like a 3D movie. You ever go see a 3D movie and you're cheating? You're taking the glasses off once you have a look? It's blurry, right? Then you put it back on, you know, the new 3D, not the old 3D back in the day, but the new 3D, it looks clear, high def in your face, and you, that's why you pay more for it, all right? Right glasses on. It's about, the Jesus, it's about the finished work of Jesus. According to the law, did you know that Jesus would be, would be disqualified as a priest? Because all priests came from the Levitical priesthood, but Jesus came from the tribe of Judah. Moses would disqualify him and say, where are your papers? So the scripture tells us where there is a change in the priesthood, there must be a change in the law, Hebrews tells us. Okay? According to the law, the high priest can't even sit down on a job. Did you know that? There was no chairs in the temple. They would communicate his job was done. So the Lord didn't permit that in the temple. Look what scripture says. Day after day, every priest stands performing his religious duties. Again and again, he offers the same sacrifice, which can never take away sins, covering, atonement. OK. But this priest, Jesus, offered for all time one sacrifice for some sins. No, one sacrifice for sins. Plural. He got them all. And then he sat down at the right hand of God. Hebrews 10, 11 and 12. He sat down. What does that distinguish? Rest. Done. He finished it. And because he finished it, he made purification for sins. Here it is. When Jesus and, and Hebrews chapter 1, verse 3 says, he's the radiance of the glory of the Father. He's the exact representation of his nature, upholds all things by the word of his power. When he made purification for sins, he dealt with it. He sat down at the right hand of God. Amen. He didn't sit down because he was the son of God. He finished taking care of the problem with sin. Then he sat down. It was finished. What position are you in in regards to your sins? Are you going to run around like Martha? Trying to clean up the house, work, 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 get right, get it right, get right, get, you gotta be ready. Or maybe you're gonna be like Mary. She did the one thing needful, she sat at Jesus' feet. You're gonna be at rest or you're gonna run around? Are you receiving his finished work? And if you are, there's a place of rest. Doesn't mean inactivity, it's just a mean a place of security of your salvation and his hope. You can spend your life running around trying to get right to get clean with God. Or you can be like Mary, sit down, relax at Jesus' feet and say, wow, Lord, thank you for this gift of salvation. Amen. Okay. Amen. So which do you think is an act of faith? So we're closer finishing it up. Did the gospel get worse because we got saved? You know, some are going to tell us 
that, you know, um, our sins have been forgiven up to the point of salvation. After that, we've got to keep short accounts with God to stay forgiven. We've got to maintain forgiveness. But isn't the gospel about once and for all forgiveness of sins? But now we're being taught that after we got saved, we got to keep a short list, stay forgiven, confess every sin. Christian bar soap is what I call it. Our last class will be on that. So that God can send us more forgiveness. In other words, the gospel got worse. We might as well wait until we get old, almost ready to die and ask for salvation. And there's less to confess. Hear me clearly. I'm not anti-confession. The word confession means homo logio. It's the word. It means homo means same. Logos means word. Same word. It means to speak the same word. So I'll give you an example. If God confesses that Jesus is Lord, I'm going to confess Jesus is Lord. That's a good confession. If he says uh, um, uh, that Jesus is the word, I'm going to confess Jesus is the word. If he says this is sin, I'm going to confess this is sin. All right, I'm in agreement saying the same thing he says. That's what confession means, literally. My confession does not make Jesus die again for my sins. And doesn't make me any more forgiven. I'm already forgiven. The problem is believers believe that they have to keep on getting forgiven when they're already forgiven. John starts out by saying this, we're closing up. I'm writing you little children because your sins, past tense, have been forgiven for his name's sake. You don't owe God nothing. Amen. Colossians tells us, when you were dead in your sins, this is were, right? Past tense. And in the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made you alive in Christ Jesus. He forgave us of all our sins, having canceled the written code with his regulations that was against us and that stood opposed to us. He took it out of the way. He nailed it to the cross. Amen. The charge against you. So here's a little math problem. So we're going to do a little math and finish it up. How many sins have you committed in your lifetime? Think of a number. Mine's are, in the, mine's are probably in the billions. I ain't going to lie. I'm terrible. I was terrible. I'm no longer, but thank you, Jesus. Okay, I'm up there. I, I, got, I got a deficit. I got a deficit. I had a deficit, right? How many did you confess? I'm sure it was a smaller number, not nearly as much as you've done. About to close right now. That's a much smaller number, so what are you going to do? So if it's about your memory and your words, you'll be lucky to be even forgiven a third of your sins. Amen. But it really makes sense when you understand the gospel. It says it's about Jesus' death and his blood, God's blood economy. Okay? Now that makes sense because this new covenant is all about what? Once and for all forgiveness of sins. Period. God's not hijacking forgiveness to give it to us later. It's just the opposite. It's about us remembering our purification. And then we'll understand how much we've been forgiven. Remember your purification, how much you've been forgiven. Your sins have been forgiven for his namesake, as I said to you earlier. Your sins he remembers no more. This is his covenant. Okay? No more. No mas. No mas. That's Hebrews 10. God sent his son into the world to save us, not to condemn us. Okay, and think of, let me close with this verse. It's the grace of God that brings salvation that appeared to all men. So grace appeared. Grace is Jesus. It's this grace that teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions. Grace teaches us to live, look, lives that are self-controlled, upright, and godly in this present age. It's his grace living through us, his presence, and a new transformed life. So the end, I hope that it blessed you. There was a lot in there, right to the wire. So, uh, we're good, okay? God bless each and every one of you. Amen.